to sort of take a step back from Israel and look a little bit more broadly at the deep sea at this point uh, and talk about really the whole deep ocean, which is the largest habitat on Earth. I'm defining this as the region below 200 meters. Here the deep sea comprises two-thirds of the surface area of our planet and represents something like 90% of the habitable volume. And because it's so vast and remote and expensive to access, we've really seen very little of the deep sea floor, less than 5%, and as a result, most of the marine species remain undescribed. So what I'd like to do this afternoon is tell you a little bit about how our view of the ocean, the deep ocean, has changed in recent decades, why we sh and, and what we've learned about biodiversity of habitats, why we should care about this, and then I'll discuss a process that I call deep ocean industrialization. You've actually been hearing about it already today. And then I'll discuss uh, the kind of stewardship imperative that this industrialization creates. So let me start just with the question, what makes the deep ocean special? For one thing, it is actually vast. It goes on for single habitats, may go on for uh, tens of thousands of kilometers. It's also extremely deep. The deepest spot is more than 10,900 meters in depth, and the average depth of the ocean is 3.8 kilometers. Because it's so deep, most of it has no light, and it has very high pressure. At the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the deepest spot, the pressure is equivalent to a human lifting 50 jumbo jets. <laughs> That's what the organisms experience. And because of all this, exploration of the deep sea is very much dependent on science and technology. And this means it's extremely expensive. And as a result, we've actually not had much access to the deep sea, and at some level, this has actually acted to protect the deep sea environments. But another very important feature of the deep sea is that it simply is, ve is very little known. And I, quoting Donald Rumsfeld, our former defense secretary, we know there are some things we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. And I have to say that most of the deep sea falls into this last category. So exploration of the deep sea began in the 1850s. Uh, serious exploration, and probably you've all heard of the Challenger expedition. There have been many other national expeditions, and the first hundred years of study, basically from surface ships, has revealed an environment that was cold, dark, with high pressure. We believed it was fairly homogeneous and stable and quite food limited, essentially a mud-covered desert. However, the last 40 years uh, have revealed really a wealth of environmental heterogeneity as a result of, of new technological innovations, and you've been hearing about them already today. We have multi-beam sonar, which allows us to map the seafloor. We have acoustical tools. We can see fish, and we can also see methane flares, for example. We have um, HOVs, human-operated vehicles, ROVs, camera sleds, AUVs, you've already heard about all of these. And they've really uh, created a very different impression of the seafloor. We now know that it's not flat and homogeneous. There are something, somewhere between 30 to 50,000 seamounts a kilometer high all over the deep ocean. Not only are they covered with uh, very lush gardens of invertebrates, but they're also sites of aggregation of fish, and we've begun a fishing industry, for example, for the ro orange ruffy on seamounts, taking advantage of the spawning aggregations. We've also learned that seamounts are covered with uh, crusts that are rich in cobalt, titanium, nickel, platinum, and a host of other elements. You can see them up there. Uh, and there's now interest in mining these crusts. We've learned that there are thousands of deep canyons cutting our continental margins. They also host a wealth of biodiversity, but they host a lot of oil and gas deposits. They also host shrimp uh, and fish that are being harvested routinely now inside the canyons. We've learned that there are biotic communities or biotic reefs formed by deep sea corals and by sponges uh, that also are home to a, a great diversity of animals, they provide important nursery functions, and they can, go, they can be very large, they go on for kilometers in the deep ocean. 
We've learned that uh, under our most productive upwelling areas, we have uh, low oxygen zones and the, the bacteria that cover the seafloor here on the continental margins where, where these impinge. These are midwater features that impinge on the margins and where they develop we often find phosphorites. There's now interest in mining these as a fertilizer replacement as we run out of phosphorus on land. We've discovered vast areas in the central oligotrophic oceans at, on the seafloor at depths of 4,000 to 6,000 meters that are covered with manganese nodules. These are small potato-sized nodules that grow very, very slowly, centimeter per million years or less, and they're full of valuable mineral resources, manganese, nickel, copper, and cobalt, and there's interest in mining these as well. And we've also discovered in the last 40 years that there are whole worlds that thrive without sunlight based on ch chemical energy. We call these chemosynthetic environments. Uh, the hydrothermal vents and methane seeps are two of them. In the case of vents, we've discovered that the precipitates that come out in the hot, when the hot water hits the cold water at vents are full of copper, gold, zinc, and silver, and there's interest in mining these. And then methane seeps, we've discovered where methane is being squeezed from the earth, that there are gas hydrates, potential energy source, which I'll talk about in a minute, and also aggregations of commercially valuable fish. For example, the Patagonia toothfish, but maybe better known as Chilean sea bass. And then we have perhaps what's the biggest habitat on earth, the deep pelagic. Uh, and this is, I'm sure, the very least known. There are many strange organisms uh, that we found, but I think there are many, many more that we haven't found. There's a lot of microbiology to learn about there as well. These, this, this habitat is home to the largest migrations on Earth, just masses of animal, vertically migrating animals, fish and zooplankton. So, so we found really, just in the last 40 to 50 years, that the deep ocean is a wealth of biodiversity. And I'm going to now t ask, why should we care about this? Well, you've been hearing about what we call the provisioning services. There are certainly oil and gas down there uh, and minerals that we're interested in, in mining, uh, the potential for pharmaceuticals and fish and shellfish as well. But the deep ocean habitats also provide important support functions. They provide habitat, food web support, refuge, and nursery grounds. And just one example, the, um, let's see if I can get the pointer to work here. All right, right here is a, a methane seep habitat that was found in the Eastern Mediterranean that turns out to be nursery grounds for sharks. Those are shark egg cases up there. Nobody knows why they're there exactly, but they are. The deep ocean also provides a very important regulating services in the form of carbon sequestration and nutrient cycling, truly massive amounts of this. And then we can think of biodiversity as an ecosystem service as well. There are untapped genetic the resources down there that might turn into um, a new an antibiotics, for example, there's important sources of biomaterials. But I think what's really most important about the genetic resources is it's the raw material that allows life in the ocean to adapt and change. And the climate in the deep ocean is changing just as in the shallow water, and we need that genetic diversity. Deep ocean is also home to scientific research, to um, important communication cables, and it's been inspiration for art, for books, for film, uh, and for artwork uh, for many, many years, and continues to be. So, so now I come to what I call industrialization of the deep ocean. And this is really fueled by population growth. You've been hearing about population growth in Israel. Well, the world is growing rapidly. When I was five years old, there were three billion people on this planet. There are now over 7 billion, and this growing population is demanding more food, more energy, more raw materials, and we now have advanced economies, hybrid cars, calculators, wind turbines, solar cells, all of these things actually use rare earth elements. And so searching for all of these, we've now depleted many of the sources on land. We have gone to shallow waters and depleted some of the sources in shallow waters, and we're now looking to the deep sea. 
Now, how can we go into the deep sea? Well, in recent years, we have basically technology that's enabled us to do that. Everything from satellites to new mapping tools to uh, better fishing equipment and the ability to construct oil and gas rigs in deep water, and now we're creating new types of mining tools that can mine at 4,000 meters on the bottom of the ocean. So what are we doing with this? Well, we're certainly fishing deeper and deeper. This figure shows fishing in, in tens of millions of tons, and you can see that after 2000, we're routinely fishing down to depths of 1,500 meters or more. Um, this, this insert here shows Antarctica. That's actually um, where our depth of increase, in, increased depth of fishing has been the greatest. All of our deep water fishing is lead, leading to overfishing. Uh, of deep water fishes to ghost fishing. This is what happens when gear is lost on, on the seafloor. It continues to collect and kill fishes. We are taking tremendous amounts of bycatch in the deep sea. Turns out that of the top 15 deep sea species in the North Atlantic Ocean, nine of them are now endangered species simply as a result of bycatch, not because they've been targeted. And we are, of course, to do much of this fishing, we trawl. And trawling is very destructive. Bottom trawling will take the lush three-dimensional structures like the coral, deep water corals you see here, and turn them into basically barren rubble. So all of this fishing is going after fish, for the most part, that are very uh, slow-growing and long-lived. A typical deep-sea fish will live more than 100 years. So when you order orange roughy in the restaurant, what you get is probably 100, 150-year-old fish. So fishing these is a little bit like cereal mining because they don't recover really very rapidly. But these are young compared to the corals that are taken down often by trawling. Some of these deep-sea corals grow very, very slowly and can be thousands of years old. And all of this, uh, the effects of this kind of trawling was really brought home to me when I was on a research cruise in 2006 off the North Island of New Zealand. We were looking for methane seeps and we discovered the country's first nine methane seeps. Um, and every single one of them had trawl damage. We found trawl marks, we found coral rubble, we found fishing gear. And of course, because New Zealand keeps meticulous records, we could go back and look at the trawling records. Every plus here was a trawling event. So one of those newly discovered seeps with all new undescribed species had been trawled 200 times. And this is actually playing out all around the world now. It's kind of... of destruction of the continental margins. Okay, we, as you've been hearing, we're going deeper and deeper for our energy, for oil and gas. This shows the uh, oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. There are almost 5,000 of them, and every t year they're built, they move deeper and deeper so that the, the oldest ones are now routinely uh, at two or, or 3,000 meters. Uh, I, sh I should say the newest ones are. And of course, the most famous of these is the the uh, yellow diamond up there, the Deepwater Horizon, which blew out, and you've already seen pictures of the size of the oil spread and, and uh, the kinds of, of scenes that develop, including oil, deepwater corals. Now, it's not just the Gulf of Mexico. Exploration globally is at both exploration and production of oil and gas are routinely going deeper and deeper every year. And this is um, a figure that shows some of the least claims. Uh, you've seen figures like this already today um, that show all the different kinds of um, energy interests and, and land claims in the eastern Mediterranean. And it, it's quite complicated, as you can guess. And I would expect things to be going deeper and deeper over time. These uh, gas seeps, those are the red dots you see there, are almost certainly associated with methane seep type communities like the tube worms you see here. Now, another potential resource, uh, energy resource, is gas hydrate. This is frozen me methane that's frozen in basically a, a water molecules, and it's a solid at high temperature and pressure, and gas hydrates are basically present all over the continental margins, as you see up there. Um, Many, no, many known, many more inferred. It's probably the greatest energy source on the planet. It's um, much more than what we have in our oil and gas reserves, but it's, been, it's because it's under very high um, 
pressure and can be explosive when, when the pressure is reduced, it's, it's very hard to actually extract it. However, Japan has some pilot stations. They're working on extracting gas hydrates uh, as a source of energy. Another resource of interest in the deep sea are the marine phosphates. I've already mentioned them. They develop along upwelling or productive margins. There are um, modern sites of modern phosphogenesis and fossil phosphates. And there are three places in, in the world where there are already lease claims to mine these at shallow upper slope depths. So off New Zealand, off Namibia, and off Mexico. New Zealand has a moratorium. These two countries are actually examining the environmental impact assessment for phosphate mining right now and trying to make decisions. But one of the important things to know about phosph phosphorite sites is they're upwelling sites. They're very productive and they support very critical fisheries. So for example, off Namibia, the same bacteria that sequester the phosphates are home to worms and bearded gobies that migrate up and feed hake and horse mackerel, which are Namibia's major fisheries. And those fish also feed uh, rich mammal populations and bird populations in the very productive Benguela ecosystem. And all of that happens at the exact same location that they propose to mine the phosphates. The same thing is playing out in New Zealand and Mexico. Um, New Zealand has uh, phosphate mining claims in green, and then this rectangle right up here is um, a marine preserve is set aside as a, nurse, a, a nursery ground for the fisheries, and you can see they occur at exactly the same place. Off Mexico, the phosphate mining uh, con concession is, is directly adjacent to the fishing concessions. It's also home to migratory whales to endangered turtles. There are many, many different kinds of conflict, spatial conflicts that are developing in the same place in the deep sea. So up to this point, I've been talking about um, resources in exclusive economic zones, um, national waters. But if you look at the white on the map up here, there's a lot of international waters and there are resources in deep water resources in those as well. And they are available to any country that has signed and ratified the law of the sea. So there are 160 countries shown up here in dark green that have. You can see Israel has not signed or ratified. The US, where I'm from, has signed but not ratified. So we don't have access to these. Um, deep sea resources, but others are going after them very quickly and there's been a rapid rise in the number of exploration contracts for manganese nodules, for sulfides at vents, and for seamount crusts in all three of the oceans. And I'll just give you one example. This is the clarion Clipperton fracture zone off Mexico here. And these are all lease claims taken out by these countries to mine manganese nodules. Um, and there are more claims made every year and uh, there's some effort to set aside terrain to protect areas. Those are the green squares you see here have been set aside as no claim zones um, without actually knowing what's out there, but with the idea that there needs to be some preservation. Each of these is 400 kilometers on a side, just to give you some idea of the size of these claims. They're the size of whole countries. So uh, what's also hot in deep sea mining is interest in mining hydrothermal vents. And that actually has, um, hap uh, there have been some international claims on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge by China and Russia and the Southwest Indian Ridge by, I think, China and India. And then there are, um, there are claims within territorial waters. Almost all the South Pacific islands, which have these massive EEZs, have um, venting areas and so their mining companies have gone in and leased and I think none of this has actually happened yet, none of the deep sea mining, but we expect to see Papua New Guinea and Nautilus Minerals have the first high, uh, deep sea mines within the next couple of years. And I, oh yes, I forgot to mention the Red Sea has a lot of vent uh, minerals resources and there's a lot of interest in mining those as well. And then I mentioned cobalt crusts on seamounts. There are leases being taken out for seamount, for mining seamount crusts. Uh, but we aren't only taking things out of the deep ocean or interested in extracting, we also put things in the deep ocean. So uh, in the past we put in radioactive waste and sewage but that's been banned by the London Dumping Convention. However, there is a loophole in that convention that allow, allows 
countries to put terrestrial mine tailings, very toxic compounds, down on the continental slope into the deep sea. So that's happening in Indonesia, Norway, Papua New Guinea, and, many, and several other countries. Chile's looking at doing this. But we end up with also a lot of waste and debris in the, in the deep ocean as the result of earthquakes and tsunamis and accidents and whatever comes down the river and through the canyons. So there's a lot happening out there. And you've been hearing already a little bit about the jurisdictions, the complex jurisdictions. Um, and I, I think I just want to point out a few things. And you've already heard a little bit about this. The, the sectors are managed separately. So fishing, energy, and minerals almost always have separate ministries, many that don't talk to each other within each country. And in, in international waters, so for, most, for many countries it's beyond 200 miles out, but for Israel, of course, there is no international waters right out in the Mediterranean, I don't think. But in, in the rest of the, uh, the ocean, the, the um, seafloor is called the area, and it's managed by the International Seabed Authority only for minerals. The water column is called the high seas, and it's managed by the FAO and regional fisheries management organizations, but only for fish. So there's nobody really protecting the fish in the uh, uh, ecosystem on the seafloor, and there's nobody managing other resources, for example, genetic resources or anything else, in the high seas and the water column. And shipping and pollution are managed by the um, International Maritime Organization. Um, and so laws regarding oil spills, for example, would be managed by them in international waters. So there, there's, a comp, there's a complex governance system. There's this siloing of the sectors that's problematic. And really, we're faced with the need to balance the use of resources that I've just described with the need to maintain the integrity of deep ocean ecosystems for, for future generations. And, and really, how do we go about doing this when there is a haphazard grabbing of resources, which is pretty much what's going on now on a first come first serve basis. And most people have no clue that this is actually happening because the deep sea is out of sight and out of mind. Okay, so now I wanted to just, I have a few more slides and I wanna talk a little bit about, you know, what do we do about this? And before I do, I just wanna point out that you've heard a lot about how little is known uh, of the Eastern Mediterranean and the region off Israel, and that's very true. But what little has been <laughs> found suggests that the ecosystems are very diverse. There are many different kinds of habitats, some of them associated almost certainly with the gas seepage. Um, and, and here are some examples of some of the different types of, of small-scale habitat patches or ecosystems that you might expect to find out there. Some of these have, ar these have already been found, but we have, I think most of the seafloor hasn't been surveyed. So, so how do we go about managing the deep ocean? Well, I, I'm going to offer up just a few simple rules. Basically, the, pre the prevalence of unknown unknowns calls for the precautionary approach. I think most of you have heard of this. It involves minimizing human impact. It involves shifting the burden of proof of impact to those who wish to carry out the activity. It involves creating comprehensive baseline data uh, and, and research, uh, and it involves doing regional planning, including creation of systems of protected areas to preserve both significant and representative areas. You've been hearing about some of the spatial planning that's, that's happening in Israel, but you know, I think it needs to move deeper and deeper, uh, for sure. Uh, second, there's really uh, the fact that we lack knowledge requires uh, mechanisms to improve deep, deep ocean research in order to enable sound decision making. There are so many questions that need to be answered to make decisions about whether to lease places or not, and how much and where, and what kinds of activities to allow. Um, we need to know about connectivity, ecosystem functions, the, the exchange between the seafloor and the water column. We need to know about community resilience in the face of impact and also about those ecosystem services that don't have a dollar value. Uh, third, we need to look at preservation as a key form of restoration unless and until appropriate restoration mechanisms can be established. This means setting aside areas for preservation in anticipation of oil spills or as mitigation for impact. 
And I think if we think about the very special features of the deep ocean, we'll recognize that there are certain aspects that need to be considered in environmental management. For example, the great longevity and slow growth of many of the deep sea animals means that recovery and restoration probably aren't possible for some, for some of the ecosystems, and this has to be taken into consideration. What are we willing to give up? Also, when, uh, when environmental impacts or uh, assessments are done, we have to talk about significance, but establishing what is a significant environmental impact in the deep ocean is really problematic. It's brand new territory. People need to be talking and thinking about this. Uh, we need to think about developing new technology and strategies for monitoring and enforcement of the deep sea. That might mean uh, development of underwater GPS, new acoustic tools for monitoring, and I'd like to suggest that next generation molecular tools, which we really haven't heard about yet today, have a very important role to play. The deep sea is dominated by small organisms, myofauna, Metazoan myofauna, foraminifera, other small groups. There are so few experts out there. People haven't described the species, but there are few taxonomists capable of doing this. And I think that to monitor impact over long periods, uh, given the great expense, we're going to need to be using molecular tools. And then finally, we have to think about protecting the unknown. In other words, it's going to be necessary to create marine protected areas for terrain we haven't seen yet just to make sure that some of it's, it's still there. Okay, and this is my last slide with a lot of words, and some of these ideas you've actually already heard about today, um, but I'm going to go through. Basically, we need to initi initiate strategical environmental assessment that crosses the sectors, so you need to be looking at the fishing, energy, and minerals industry all at the same time, and other sectors, cable laying, and so on. Um, and this requires multiple multidisciplinary expertise. We need to generate baseline data that not just goes out and samples once to describe what's there, but that actually characterizes natural variability. Otherwise, how are you going to know if changes at post drilling or post uh, fishing or whatever are the result of impact of that activity or are they just part of the natural fluctuations in the system or are they the result of climate change or what, what's going on. So a lot of baseline work needs to be done. I think really it's important to establish observatory, long-term observatories to collect data over decades. Uh, next I think it's very uh, wise to have early engagement of the stakeholders with outcomes that bind. You already heard about spatial planning going on with stakeholders. Well, there are many deep sea stakeholders that need to be brought into the picture. They include industry, government, regulators, scientists, and of course, civil society. I think we need a lot more research and we need to develop research funding sources that are independent of industry. It might, it might be fine to use industry money, but the research needs to be funds need to be administered independently so there's no question about the results and how to interpret them. I think you heard a little bit about the legal framework and, and the need for um, strengthening re regional agreements. For uh, This is very important for addressing safety and accidents. Uh, the, from the reading I've done, I, it seems there's a protocol for protection of the Mediterranean Sea against pollution resulting from exploration and exploitation of the continental shelf, and this sits within a non-binding convention for the protection of the marine environment and coastal region of the Mediterranean. But it's non-binding, and it's very important that the world actually establish a set of international standards to help regulate what happens and how uh, the process after we have accidents and oil spills that are undoubtedly are going to in, um, involve multiple countries. Certainly in the Mediterranean, can't imagine any kind of, of gas or oil blowout that doesn't involve multiple countries' waters. And then finally, I'd like to suggest that there's actually a lot of global expertise, and there's a group out there called the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative that's trying to integrate science, technology, policy law, and economics to advise on ecosystem-based management of resource use in the deep ocean and to develop strategies that maintain the integrity of deep ocean ecosystems both within and beyond national jurisdictions. This is really a conversation that's just starting. Mining hasn't happened in the deep sea, for example, yet. 
but it's about to. We need uh, to do holistic environmental management. And I did bring a couple of flyers about DOSI, the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative. If anybody wants them, I'm happy to give them out to you. And with that, I'll close. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.